Thank you so much for coming out. Welcome to another episode of Do Go On. This one recorded live at the wardrobe. My name is Dave Horn. It's not just me and you here. Please give it up for Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Yeah. Hello. This is awesome. This is very fun. And uh, I don't know if anyone saw that, but I spilt my beer all over myself on the way out. Very rock and roll. Yeah, very rock and roll. I, I was tempted to tip it all over myself, but... Um, That'll be the finale of the show. Look forward to that. <laughs> Look forward to that. Oh, here we are in Leeds. Are we are Matt sitting down? Yeah, okay. Matt's doing it. Yes. I'm not going. I'm not weak. <laughs> no, I'm weak. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Everyone Gosh. in the room sitting, Dave. You just called 200 mad English people weak. Sorry. Look at them. They're furious. <laughs> really quietly <laughs> furious. Really. Foaming at the mouth. Oh, no, that's okay. Get that checked out. Okay. <laughs> 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 Up the back, how you doing? <laughs> All right. It's just a little hand, like. <laughs> yeah, one hand, one hand from the darkness. Cute. Oh, so so great to be here. Um, give me a round of applause if you are from Leeds itself or very close by. Oh, okay. I mean, there was like maybe half a second of, am I from Leeds? <laughs> All close by. Um, that didn't feel like a huge majority. Oh, no. Uh, give me a round of applause if you're Ooh. not from Leeds or close by. I mean, that's very cool that you've travelled, but we've come 24 hours. We came for 24 hours. <laughs> and we are exhausted! Oh. So, so where, where are we from then? Brighton. Brighton. Lots of people from Sheffield? I did just hear London. <laughs> Do you know we're doing two shows there? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, brutal to find out this way. <laughs> Sucked in, dickhead. <laughs> I've started uh, drinking early yeah. today. Yay. Uh, now, one thing I always do at the start of the shows, and Matt loves it when I do this. Well, yeah. <laughs> I say that because he had to remind me to do it when we were in Edinburgh a couple of nights ago, which was a. Uh, a very, very fun time. Uh, give me a round of applause if you've ever heard our podcast Do Go On Before. <laughs> nice. That is a relief. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I know. Imagine if you just wandered into this dark room all the way from London. <laughs> be amazing. Uh, give me a round of applause and don't be shy if you've never heard Do Go On ever before. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's you. It's a couple, but also. The flair with which she claps. Yeah, it was like this. <laughs> yes. Damn. <it>. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for obviously being a tag along or Thank just you. walking into a dark room. Um, I imagine that opening sketch was very long for you. <laughs> Look, it's long for us out the back, to be honest. <laughs> um, Getting ready to pump. But a uh, big thanks to Michael Caine for lending his voice uh, to that. Yeah. So. What, what an honour. What a privilege. What an absolute privilege. Does anyone even know who those people are talking in that thing? Oh, yeah. okay, right. Auntie Donna fans, some people know them? Oh, great, great. They are very, very funny people. If you haven't seen them online, uh, it's probably better than this, so... Uh, <laughs> do that. Later. Don't do later. it now. Later. You can do that later. It's but a, yeah. Isn't it a, it's a weird yeah. gap between us and you? Oh, that was nice. That felt good. Uh, she was foaming at the mouth earlier. I wouldn't touch her hand. <laughs> I'd oh. wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's sure. Washing. Is this is this what you wanted to see? Is it are we doing it yet? <laughs> yeah? yeah. <laughs> right. No, like, but that was a yeah? <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm happy. I think I'm happy. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, Matt did doing. ten push ups backstage before we came out. I don't here. know if there was ten. It was quite quite that impressive. Was, that was a private conversation, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, when you told me you did 10 push-ups, <laughs> that conversation was private. <laughs> okay, well, for the people that haven't heard the show before, basically we do a report on a topic suggested by a listener, and this week it is my turn to do a topic. Yeah. 
hard, hard not to find that that joy hurtful. Yeah. Um, no. uh, give me a round of applause if you don't want it to be Jess or Matt doing the topic. No, don't. <laughs> you know what? Us either, to be honest. Yeah. No, you guys have more fun when you're we recording anyway. We really do. Either. Yeah, I don't know. It feels like I've got nothing much to do here. I'm thinking about heading back to the green room. <laughs> doing a few more push-ups? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> His form was excellent, I should say. Slow, in control. It was... No. <laughs> I mean, we do have this space on the stage. Maybe later his arms are a little bit tired now. Oh, yeah. Obviously very good for a podcast, doing a bit of yeah. quiet exercise on the we, floor. <laughs> how about we all pretend? Oh, look, he's going. Wow. Oh. 79. <laughs> 106. All right. I can't count. Um, I did have several people message me directly asking who was doing the report today, and I can't help but feel they wanted it to be you. <laughs> there was a certain subtext. Yeah. Because I won't buy tickets if it's two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have... Um, oh, we really should say right at the top, we are doing uh, an extra show straight, pretty much straight after this at 5 o'clock in the same room. If you enjoy this, no pressure... We are doing a, an extra, a bonus, a very loose episode. A bit of a, I've prepared a quiz for Matt and Jess and the audience to have a go at. So it's going to be a, a bit of fun. It's very last minute, but if you want to stick around, it is £10 on the door. So I thought I'd say that at the top so you can think about your options. Always selling, Dave. We're in the, they've, they've already bought tickets for this and you're trying to sell them tickets oh, for that. Oh, yes. Look at them, they're furious. <laughs> I'm also trying to start a riot. <laughs> I'm with them. <laughs> I'm also selling an iPad if anyone's interested. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, what, is that the everything's okay alarm? I mean, what? It's like the it's, lift out the back. Oh, that's the lift. Yeah, so the people at the back didn't hear that beep that you okay. just referenced. Um, but thanks for that. <laughs> I, I now look insane. Yeah. <laughs> Stop beeping. Stop it. Stop. <laughs> okay, uh, so my, my report. Uh, we always start with a question to get us onto topic. I'm going to throw it over to Jess and Matt, and if they can't get it, then I'll throw it over to you lovely people. If we can't get it, if we can't get it. All right, question. Which author? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I like it. All right. Okay. Hey, I'm a man that respects a comma. I mean, I can see your page now, so. Which author disappeared in December 1926? Oh, it's the old lady. You know the one, Poirot? Man. Uh, she was not an old lady at the time, I can oh. tell you that. Well, she is now. <laughs> I assume. If they found her. What's her name? Agatha? It is Agatha Christie. We did it. Another uh, one for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done, Jess. Did you have any idea that she No, I read it on your page when you showed me your thing. <laughs> so I stayed respectfully quiet. Thank you. Yeah. Did she write these old people books when she was young? Yeah. Well, I'm going to say, she had a prolific life. Ah, cannot wait to hear about uh, it. Any uh, Agatha Christie fans in the crowd today? <laughs> people? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You had no choice. Mum made you. Right. Your mum made you watch it. Uh, anyone? I'm a big, big fan of the Poirot series with David Suchet. I imagine that he is your superstar here. And he sush heads in. Yeah, come on. It's sush in tonight. That would make my life. David, David Suchet? Okay, he's not here. To, All right. to, uh, so, to put it in a context for people who don't know Agatha Christie, she's sort of like England's Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, I yeah. think that's right. You've explained that so well. Uh, so she's one of the greatest mystery writers of all time and she created one of the most intriguing real-life mysteries when in 1926 she disappeared. <gasps> this is her story. <laughs> bum, bum. Oh, I've got to tell you, I mean, this kind of ruins the, the thing I'm building there, but it was this topic has been suggested by uh, a few people. Edward McCann from Dublin. No one? <laughs> uh, you can do it with everyone. Okay, yep. Uh, Emma from Auckland. Did Emma make it over? <laughs> it's probably uh, just as long a journey. Seba, our most prolific Icelandic listener. Seba in! Is Seba here? I love this one. Chris Williams, who just wrote, I'm from the UK. <laughs> Chris? 
I really want someone to be in. There's someone in, look. What? Uh, me from Glasgow, who also suggested the iron brew topic I did in Scotland two nights ago. Me. There you go. <laughs> and uh, Anastasia from Jersey City, New Jersey. Are you in? Okay, fair enough. There you go. Uh, so this is the life of Agatha Christie leading up to that mysterious, I was going to say mysterical <laughs> disappearance. Uh, Agatha, <laughs> Mary Clarissa Miller. Agatha! <laughs> well, I'm locked into saying that for the rest of the hour, aren't I? <laughs> Uh, Agatha Mary <laughs> Clarissa Miller was born on the 15th of September, 1890. A good year. <laughs> Thank you. How goes that accent? A good year. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much better than when we have Aussie so Yeah. Like we could talk. Like our, anyway, yeah. I was being genuine, Jeff. Yeah, no. Me too. You're a mean-spirited person. <laughs> Uh, she was born in Torquay in Devon in a comfortably well-off middle-class family. Her father, Frederick Miller, was a wealthy New York-born stockbroker. Her mother was the British-born Clara Miller. She was the uh, youngest of three siblings. She was mostly homeschooled by her parents, although her mother had a weird thing where she decided that Agatha shouldn't be allowed to read until she was eight years old. <laughs> okay. I wonder why eight? I don't know what happens at eight. You can suddenly... I, have I told this story on the podcast? You couldn't read till you were eight. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't read. Um, that fr- A friend that I went to... Uh, a friend that I knew in school, he got married and had uh, a few kids and his first... Oh, he won't... Nah, he won't listen. Um, Is he in tonight? <laughs> his first child was called Eleanor and uh, and I was asking if they if they call her like Ellie or anything. He goes, no, no, no. Um, we won't call her Ellie until she's five. We want her to know her real name. <laughs> They've had two more children since. Like they shouldn't breed. But because um, I somehow I must have been a child genius because I figured out that my name was Jessica. I just figured it out somehow. But your, Eleanor, not Your name's right. Jessica? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well, Agatha was also a very clever child. She ignored her mother and taught herself to read by the age of five. Do you think oh, it's because all the books in their house were porn? <laughs> not till you're eight. <laughs> So I think that's a good rule. I think that's a good rule. No porn good till you're eight. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. At least. At least. At least. Yeah. Kids these days. <laughs> <laughs> Getting into porn too early. <laughs> Personal experience? I'd rather not say. Okay. Uh, despite this uh, weird rule, weird rule, Agatha described her childhood as very happy, and she thought herself lucky to have a wise and patient nanny named Marie. She also had a pet dog called George Washington. Yes. I met a dog the other day called Bill Murray. I just like dogs with full names. <laughs> Last name. Yeah. Was, the, was George Washington any relation to the president of America? Great grandchild. <laughs> that oh, is fascinating. Nice. <laughs> I'm never having a real proper education and due mainly to boredom, Agatha found herself making up stories and acting out the different parts. There's nothing like boredom to make you write, she would later say. Her father, not well since the advent of uh, financial difficulties, died after a series of heart attacks when Agatha was 11. Okay. Oh. <laughs> correct. Heartless. One, one, of you, one of you was correct. Uh, she describes this as the end of her childhood as the family went through financial strain. David Suchet, your rock star. <laughs> the actor who played Poirot in the TV series speculates that that may be the reason that in over half of her novels, money is the motive for murder. Uh, her mother, Clara, was um, just... Spoilers. Oh, sorry, sorry. There's a lot of murder <laughs> in her murder mysteries. <laughs> Would you believe it? Uh, her mother was distraught over her husband's death and Agatha became her cl- mother's closest companion. So fuck you to the other two children. <laughs> Uh, Agatha studied for a time in <laughs> Agatha <laughs> <Let me do laughs> <it again. laughs> studied for a time in Paris and was a gifted pianist as a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, p- no pianist till you're eight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. 
Or oh, I love this. Agatha Christie's website, her official website, now claims she would have been a professional, but her extreme shyness in front of strangers prevented this from happening. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. Oh, I could. I just had a like attention. I could, have, could, I could have, have. Yeah. I could have won like seven Academy Awards if I could act. <laughs> <laughs> just that one little hurdle. Can I believe it? <laughs> Is that a quote from David Suchet? Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe he's never won an Academy Award? Yeah. Robbed. Can you believe it? Robbed. No. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Too genuine. <laughs> too, ge- too genuine. <laughs> too real. Uh, her mother Clara's health demanded that they move to a warmer climate, and for three months they lived in Cairo, as you do. Uh, during her time there, now age 20, she went to lots of parties and wore lots of evening dresses. Again, a quote from Agatha Christie's website. Apparently, she was a bit of a hit, and she met lots of other British expats and knocked back five marriage proposals. Yep. Been there. <laughs> How many... What's the marriage proposal count up to now? Eight. Wow. Yeah, no marriage till you're eight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the rule... It's a very versatile rule, it really yeah. is. <laughs> Next one. Going to do it. <laughs> so she's knocking back... Marriage proposals left, right, and centre. That was until a young hotshot pilot named Archie Christie came into her life in 1912. They met at a dance. Their courtship uh, courtship was a whirlwind affair. Both were desperate to marry, but had no money of their own. Oh, it's good when you're both desperate, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, That's no when else. romance really flies. I, I need this. <laughs> I need this to work. I mean, I didn't even have to act that, so... Yeah. That was a direct quote from my own life. Uh, so it's this. He was a very attractive man. <laughs> see a lot of myself in this man. Who her mother didn't want her to marry as she didn't think he'd treat her properly and was worried that he was attractive to women and a bit of a player. Sadly, her mother was very right, as we will later discover. So you should always marry an uggo. <laughs> Mark it down. It's a rule. You look. You did look right into my eyes as you said that. <laughs> You'll be fine, Matt. <laughs> nah, good on you. Um, according to Christie's autobiography, it was quote the excitement of the stranger that attracted them both. I mean, the, the strange is when you sit on your hand. <laughs> <laughs> feel like you guys know what that. I don't have to yeah, elaborate any further. Uh, Come on, I I, I, that. I know that all too well. I know. <laughs> oh, I know that technique. <laughs> I'm painting myself as the lonely I one. I know, today, but so. like when I start to pity you, you've gone too far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I need this. <laughs> I need this. <laughs> Talking to my own hand. Nice to meet you. (laughs) And then what do you do? (laughs) A few push-ups. Get in the zone. Uh, Being a pilot, in 1914, Archie went to fight in World War I. He was in the Air Force and convinced he was going to die, they got married in secret whilst he was on leave. They met infrequently during the war years, and it wasn't until January 1918, when Archie was posted to the war office in London, that Agatha felt her married life truly began. Right. Okay. (laughs) Uh, I don't mind the idea of, like, long-distance marriage, you know? Like, getting married and not seeing them for four years. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) I mean, you work out if you want to be with them by the end of that, don't you? Makes the heart grow stronger, fonder, whatever. (laughs) Uh, Whilst he was away, she volunteered as a nurse at a hospital in Torquay. Often quite gruesome, it really shocked the upper-class young lady. It was during the First World War that Agatha turned to writing her detective stories. She was at least partly inspired by her sister, Madge, who bet her that... I know, it's funny. It's funny. Madge and Agatha. (laughs) Beautiful names you have over here. (laughs) Uh, Madge... Madge and Agatha. Madge. Madge bet Agatha that she couldn't write a good detective story. 
<laughs> what a, Supportive. I hope Madge felt like a fucking idiot for the rest of her life. You'd be like... Yeah. That Cop that, Madge. Madge. Sucked in, Madge. Why didn't Madge dare her to become a piano player, huh? Because she wasn't good enough, that's why. <laughs> well, you know the truth. Uh, this is all happening whilst uh, Christy was working at the hospital, uh, where she came into contact with Belgian refugees, and this inspired her to create the world's most famous detective, a Mr. Hercule Poirot. Ever heard of him? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> How about David Suchet? Oh! Oh, oh yeah. Suchet. He's a rock star here. He's such a rock star. I reckon there'd be a few English people in here with uh, Suchet tattoos, I reckon. And he... Hold on the back. Hold his big face. We have been talking about getting uh, a tattoo on this tour and Matt suggested that we do get matching Poirot-themed tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> And honestly, I, re- I remember saying this real well. Yeah. What else? It, go on. What else? <laughs> I'm not adverse to the idea. One of us gets the Suchet mustache. Another one gets Inspector Jap. <laughs> Hastings. <laughs> I mean, Jess is, was really keen on the idea. I've never seen it. Oh yeah, and I'm the other guy. What's the other guy? Though? I'll be that guy. Greg. Uh, Captain Hastings? Greg? Okay, yeah. Gregory Hastings. Uh, Arthur Hastings. Thank you. <laughs> so close. Shit, I've already... Uh, it's too late, but I've already got it. Greg, <laughs> Greg Gregory <Hastings>. in bold. <laughs> Just so. the word Gregory. Gregory. Check out my Poirot tattoo. It says Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Uh, I'm still open to the idea. So all this is happening. Uh, she's meeting Belgian refugees and uh, she creates Hercule Poirot during the war. He debuted on her pages in 1916 in a novel that she called The, the Mysterious Affair at Styles. It was, as novels often are, rejected several times, but eventually it was published in 1920. So it took four years. Yeah, it took a bit of, bit of time. Wow. Uh, the book set up many of the tropes she would be famous for. It was set at, again, spoilers if you don't like hearing the tropes. Uh, it was set at a wealthy country house with many possible suspects. A murder by poisoning. Why his lip ring? <laughs> Stop looking at his lips. Uh, 50% of the murders in her books are by poison. She developed her fascination with poisons during her time at a dispensary during as the war. As a snake. <laughs> she lived her mid 20s as a snake and. Uh, uh, she got her knowledge of poisons by training as a pharmacy assistant, and that gave her a bit of the inside scoop for the rest of her writing days. So that's the war. Archie came back. This is the hot shot. The Dave Warnocky of the story, if you will. Uh, he came home at the... Uh... I will not. <laughs> Matt, will you? I need this. Uh, he came back at the end of the war and took up a job in London where they had just enough money to rent a flat. Later that year, on the 5th of August, Agatha gave birth to their, birth to their only daughter, Rosalind. Rosalind. Better than Madge. <laughs> it's a little bit better than Madge. Uh, it was also this time that the mysterious affair at Styles with Poirot was taken on by a publisher who also contracted her to write five more books. Ooh. So it's all happening now. Uh, in 1922, leaving Rosalind with her nurse and her mother, she and Archie travelled across the British Empire promoting the Empire Exhibition of 1924. In Cape Town, South Africa, she became one of the first Europeans to learn to surf standing up. (laughs) I guess before that it was, do you you guys call it boogie boarding here? I heard a definite no. (laughs) But also an enthusiastic, yeah. Yeah. So I think she's just being polite. On one of their many surf beaches over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's the lead surf like? Strong. 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 Uh, she may have been the first female Briton to achieve the feat of standing up while surfing. All I'm hearing in my head is na 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 And are you imagining that old woman that we all know Agatha Christie as? Yeah. That's what I'm that's all I can see right now. And it's great. I love her. so that was the that was the biggest achievement of her life in 1924. in 1925, Christie and her family left London for Sunningdale, where they lived in a house named Styles after her first novel. 
She also got her first car and everything was going great. She changed publishing deals and continued to write and in the novel, The Merger of... The Merger. Also Murder. Of Roger Ackroyd, she was the first writer to have the murderer be the narrator of the book. Hmm. I feel like things are going a little too well for her. Hell yeah. She was at the top of her game and always ahead of the curve when it came to the crime genre. Everything was going a little too well. <laughs> I just called that. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, money was now coming in with a young daughter and husband. It all seemed to be going swimmingly for Agatha, I wrote here. Okay. Or surfingly. Didn't write that, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Thank then, God. In her autobiography, she writes, quote, the next year in my life is one that I hate recalling. And so often in life, when one thing goes wrong, everything goes wrong. Is that a threat, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> that do, felt like fun. Do not let one thing go wrong, because it's all going wrong. <laughs> I'll just do that anytime you need a sip. Oh, please, that'd be... <laughs> Would really Just make, let me get to the keychain it makes, eventually. It makes drinking beer way more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, and more extreme. <laughs> all right, it's not hard to see why Christy disliked the next year in her life. First of all, her husband Archie, who did turn out to be a massive player, started carrying on with golfer and friend of the family, Nancy Neal. I love this line from agathachristie.com. Archie was a keen golfer. Agatha, not. <laughs> That really makes it seem like it's her fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you'd been into golf. Yeah. Uh, this is the same year that Agatha's mother, Clara, died, and she was devastated by the loss. So there's two hits already. Agatha was in charge of clearing out her childhood house where she grew up, and she was doing this one day when Archie turned up and announced that he was having an affair with Nancy Neal and that he wanted a divorce. For Agatha, this was all too much. What a dog. What an absolute dog. George Washington. Yeah. Sorry, I zoned out for a bit. Are we talking about George Washington again? What a dog. <laughs> you thinking about George Washington? Yeah. What's he doing? Oh, he's doing little flips. <laughs> That's cool. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> he's surfing. Wish I'd had a sip. On Friday, uh, December 3rd, 1926, Agatha Christie got up from her armchair and went into her sleeping daughter's room and kissed the now seven-year-old Rosalind goodbye. Oh, one more year till porn. <laughs> <laughs> Hang in there, Rosalind. <laughs> we all remember our first porn. <laughs> Tell us about yours. <laughs> <laughs> a wanka 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 wanka. Look, I had a crack there, but um, <laughs> I mean, a wanka 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 was yours? Wanka. That was me trying to do porn surf music. Yeah. Huh? Did I did translate. That was great. Thank you. Wanka wanka wanka. <laughs> what are you doing with your hand? Playing. I'm slapping slapping my dick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is regret face. You've got the. <laughs> You've got one of the lowest voices of anyone I know, and even when you play uh, your dick, it sounds like a bass guitar. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I thought he was travelling with his bass guitar. Turns out oh. those noises we can hear from his room are very different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we shared a room that first night. Sorry. Oh, I was like, oh, he's just listening to the, listening to the red hot chili peppers again. <laughs> oh, no. No. <laughs> when you feel the funk, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so she kissed Rosalind goodbye. Then she climbed into her, her Morris Cowley car and drove off into the night. She was reported missing by her family the next morning. Bit eager, she could have just popped out for milk. Got to wait a certain amount of time, don't you? How long would you wait? <laughs> wait, who's gone missing? Because Ag it's a different answer for each person. Agatha Christie. Oh. oh. A week? Yeah. Like, I haven't seen anybody seen 
eggs. I'd call her eggs. Um, and then her, call up Madge. Ugh. Anyway, it didn't take police long to locate her car several miles away, abandoned in a remote location called Newlands Corner. There was no evidence of the car having been involved in an accident. Her coat and driver's license were on the back seat, but Christy was nowhere to be seen. Police were immediately worried, and her disappearance would spark one of the largest manhunts ever mounted. Agatha Christie was already a famous writer at this time, and more than 1,000 policemen were assigned to the case, along with hundreds of civilians. A thousand policemen? Yeah. That's all of them. I mean, it, it would have been a great Surely. time. Great time to commit a crime. Is that all the cops? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, all the cops. 300 men with dogs also searched for her. Three, yeah, okay, great. And it was the first search... So it was 301. We'd have to shoot one of the dogs. Oh. I'm sorry. 300. That's Great. Right. Proceed. So don't worry. It was 300 exactly. That's because they shot a couple of the dogs. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it was also the first search to use aeroplanes. Ah, oh, how? Two, two aeroplanes. No, I shoot, didn't say shoot. how many. I said how did they use them? Looking out the window. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's not down there. Oh, that could be her. Oh, that's an ant. Oh, we're not even off the ground yet. <laughs> I haven't been in a plane before. <laughs> Look at that. That guy's about to lose his shit when that plane takes off. <laughs> oh, where'd that ant go? <laughs> now we've got two missing people. Uh, <laughs> uh, some people claim that 15,000 people came, to, came out to look for it. No matter how many, it was, it was a massive search. Police were worried that she may have fallen down one of the many gravel pits in the area and that she may have been lying at the bottom, bottom of one of them, hurt and helpless. Police also expressed concern that she'd been the victim of serious crime. Tax fraud. <laughs> it's serious, Jess. I know. It was front page news across the UK and when she didn't turn up for over a week... Aha, thank you. Uh, it was front page news all over the world, including the New York Times. It's Two hours for you. Oh, thank you. Is Thanks, you. <laughs> Do I understand? What, wait, what's the context of that? <laughs> Just so you... If you were missing... Oh, great. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Thanks, yeah, mate. Yeah. Six months. <laughs> David Suchet. David Suchet, about one minute. <laughs> Look, um, I've actually also got an app open here that tracks his movements. He's at Harrods right now, doing quite well for himself. Uh, anyway, it's fr news all over the world. Dave, he... if you're tracking him on your device, how is he going missing? Oh, that's how he avoids. If he goes, if he disappears off this for one minute, I will have to leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> Does sorry. he know about the tracking? Oh no. Okay. It's safer for him if he doesn't know. Have you used the tracking to meet him in person or are you doing it to avoid meeting oh, him? No, no, I've never met him. Sure. Well, I, I've seen him, but he hasn't seen me. How did you put the... Where is the tracker? Well, in, in his moustache? Yeah. <laughs> it's in his butt, isn't it? One of you is correct. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't have a real moustache. <laughs> have a real butt? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. That too <laughs> Does oh, he yeah. have a butt? Oh, yeah. Oh. oh, hell yeah. Anyway, it seemed to be as good a mystery as she could ever write, except that it was happening in real life. Every day, the stories of what could have happened to her got crazier and crazier, with the press speculating wildly. Apparently, close to where the car was found was a natural spring known as the Silent Pool, where two young children were reputed to have died. Some journalists ventured to suggest that the novelist may have deliberately drowned herself there. Newspapers often offered a large 100 pound reward for anyone that spotted her and this inspired more people to go on the hunt. Mm. So everyone's looking for Ag. With the book selling well and the fact that she was a household name by this point, outwardly it looked like she was on top of the world. If she had chosen to dis disappear, people couldn't work out why. There were rumours that she'd been murdered by her husband Archie who some people now talking to the press were saying she was a serial cheater and he was known to have the mistress Nancy Neal, golf player. The UK's Home Secretary, William jo William Joynson. 
One more time. <laughs> William Joynson Hicks. I can only assume he's from New Jersey. I can only assume that. Joynson. It's Johnson with a Y. Love it. Joynson. Am I saying that right? You're reading it like you've never re- read it before, but you wrote this. <laughs> William Joynson. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so he's a big deal. He's a home, home secretary in the UK. He, he's freaking out because no one, no one can find it. It's looking bad for him. So he urged the police to make faster progress in finding her as it did not look good for the police, her being missing for so long. Uh, History Extra recalls that two of Britain's most famous crime writers, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, and Dorothy L. Sayers, author of the Lord Peter Whimsey series, were both drawn into the search as experts. Their specialist knowledge, it was hoped, would find the missing writer. They're experts in writing. I know. Have you tried looking for her in a library? (laughs) Or a cafe with (laughs) Wi-Fi? He tips his hat and leaves. What a hero. Hmm? You've spaced out again, haven't you? No. Now, so Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, been employed. And if you've heard my report on Sherlock Holmes, you'll remember that one of Arthur Conan Doyle's specialist skills was cult stuff concerning the afterlife. After his son died in the war, he went a little bit strange and believed in fairies as well as many other supernatural things. He went a little bit strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm being polite. I'm going to put that on my tombstone. That she could, went a little bit strange. Could you say it in a way that's less polite? What are you trying to say? He lost it big time. (laughs) Basically, he tried to use paranormal powers to solve the mystery of where Agatha Christie was. Okay. Well, I didn't see anybody else coming up with any ideas, so... (laughs) He took one of Christie's gloves to a famous medium, hoping that it would give answers where normal police work had failed. It didn't. (laughs) So, uh, any theories at this point from you guys? Mole people. Interesting. Interesting. Obviously. Matt, any theories as to... Yeah, I reckon reckon she's just... She's just looking for inspiration for a book, right? She's just needs a getaway. Yeah, but she's also like, she, I reckon she's just, yeah. She, did she end up turning this into a night boat to Cairo or some sort of big story? Night boat to Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of hers, isn't it? It's, or is night that ma- boat. I oh, know. What's a night boat? No, I think it's a it's a madness song. Sorry. Um, <laughs> What's that? She's got a Cairo boat as well. Anyway, it doesn't death, matter. Death on doesn't the Nile. Nile. Death boat to Cairo. <laughs> Listen up. Well, on December the 14th, 1926, she turned up. <gasps> how long How long had she been missing? She'd been away for a couple of weeks. Okay, that's just a nice getaway. She was alive. Did we let people know we were leaving Australia? <laughs> Yeah, we got, we, got some, we got some calls to make. Just don't mind Matt for a minute. Um, can you message my mum in there as well? Yes. Uh, she was alive and well at the Swan Hydro, now the old Swan Hotel in Harrogate, or Harrogate, just 16 Ooh. miles from where we are right now. Ah, a few now. Harry heads in. <laughs> huh? There's a Harrogate in the front really? row. Have you been to the, uh, the old Swan Hotel? Brother, Brother got Harry. married there, Dave. He's basically David Suke or whatever. <laughs> Did you know the connection when you went there? Yeah. <laughs> so I imagine yeah. None, oh, of, yeah. none of this is impressing you so far. Nah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, okay, he's pretty honest, this guy. <laughs> we love that. Uh, so it, it is just 16 miles or 25k uh, kilometres from where we are right now. Thank very, you very for close. converting Which that is for why, me. Yeah, thank you. Which is why I chose this as a topic, because we're so close and we can go the, to that hotel. No, absolutely not. <laughs> right, well, 16 miles, I'm walking after this. <laughs> so she's turned up, but more questions were raised, however, as Christy herself was unable to provide any clues as to what had happened to her. She apparently remembered nothing. Okay. Police seemed to come to the conclusion that Agatha Christie had left home and travelled to London, travelling, uh, crashing and then abandoning her car on route. So she's driving to London but crashed on the way. She then somehow, still a mystery, travelled the 30 miles to King's Cross Station in London where she boarded a train to Harrogate. On arriving at the spa town, she checked into the Swan Hydro on December the 4th with almost no luggage. One of the strangest things is that she checked in under the assumed name of Teresa Neal, which is the surname of her husband's mistress. <laughs> I mean, that would be the name that would be on your mind a lot, probably. Yeah, yeah. and she also claimed that she was from South Africa. Did she do an accent? Because that's not okay. (laughs) 
And if she did, I think it would sound a little something <laughs> like this. Hello, I'm Theresa May. <laughs> no, Theresa May, that's a different one. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Fuck. Did you guys know the truth about your Prime Minister? <laughs> Ask for a birth certificate, so I'm saying. <laughs> I'm a truther. <laughs> Teresa truther. <laughs> uh, I don't know what Harrogate's like these days, but apparently it was the height of elegance in the 1920s. Is it still like that? People are laughing. <laughs> It was quite the place to be for young wealthy types and Agatha did nothing to arouse suspicion as she joined in with all the balls, dances and the entertainment. <laughs> you got to hide in plain sight at the ball. Uh, she wasn't recognised, which might seem strange because she's such a famous person. Yeah, but, but she was doing the accent. Yeah. <laughs> which sounded a little something like this. How's it? I'm Theresa Neal. Not bad. I, I like <laughs> I, I like the ball <laughs> That's good stuff uh, Matt, what would it sound like if she was Borat like was there too yeah. <laughs> I like the ball What would it sound like if she had some sort of uh, like diplomatic <laughs> immunity Oh yeah, that would have been the one to go for Um <laughs> Ha. <laughs> what? All right, stop laughing. Ha, 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 ha. Hi. I have diplomatic immunity. <laughs> My name is Teresa, whatever you said before. And it's weird that she was carrying guns with her to this ball as well. But I mean, yeah, that's, that would have sounded a bit like... <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> Whoa, it's so realistic. No, that was just me clearing my... Oh, wow. <coughs> that was the gun. Oh. <laughs> he is good. The man of a thousand the, noises. The first time is clapping. Yeah. That must be fucking bizarre to you. <laughs> I don't even get it. You love balls. <laughs> that is very funny and deserve more, to be honest, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just love balls. <laughs> Fucking hell. That's good. Do we get that? We get that on tape? <laughs> Two thumbs up. Thank Two you. Thumbs up. Thanks, Excellent. Dave. Uh, so it's weird that she might not be recognised, but she, she was being a writer. She was a household name, but people didn't necessarily know what she looked like. Sure. So you could blend in a little bit. Uh, eventually, she was recognised by one Much of the... Much like being a podcaster. <laughs> yeah. Hide in plain sight, you know? Except I walk around going, Hello, I'm Jess Perkins! <laughs> And they go, please stop yelling at me, madam. I'm a podcaster! <laughs> and people say, what does that mean? Yeah, mostly my grandma. Um, she doesn't get it. I don't get it. My parents tried to explain to my 94-year-old grandma what we were doing here. It's like, it's a podcast. And she's like, what? It's a bit like a radio show. She's like, oh, okay. And people can listen at home. She's like, oh, okay. Why are they turning up to see it live? <laughs> A very Thanks. good question. Thanks, Grandma. Thanks a lot, Grandma. 94 years old. Uh, eventually, uh, Agatha was recognised by one of the hotel's banjo players, Bob Tappan. <laughs> the banjo. Which one's that again? What does a banjo sound like? I think it might sound a little something. I like this. <laughs> no, actually... Uh, because there's multiple banjos, I think it would be good if we could hear dueling banjos. Yeah. Oh, all from me. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Was that it? But a ding 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 ding. Oh yes. But a ding 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 ding. But a ding 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 ding. Oh. I lost control of that light. <laughs> Fantastic. Their patience for that bit is running out, if you want to just... Yeah, I'll, I'll pop the brakes on it now, sorry. Uh, oh, so... will I? <laughs> so the banjo player recognised her. Uh, he tipped off her, her husband... Oh, he told police, and they tipped off her husband, Colonel Christie, Christy, who came to collect Agatha immediately. Respectively, uh, Bob, the banjo player, didn't go to the press and claim the £100 reward, which would have created a media storm. Bob, the banjo player. 
Yes. Can he pluck it? <laughs> but should he? Look, I'm, every now and then I'll say something and you guys will sigh and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's had another go, hasn't he? Uh, so he didn't sell her out to the press, but the press got wind of the story anyway and the media rush arrived to get photos of her leaving the hotel and this hit the front pages again around the world. Amazingly, Christy left her cheating husband waiting in a badass move when the cheater arrived, she kept him uh, waiting in the hotel lounge while she decided to change into an evening dress. Yes. Badass. Ah, so there's some theories. Over the years, there's been a lot of theories as to what caused and exactly happened during this 11-day disappearance. Archie claimed that his wife was suffering from amnesia and had no recollection of the events. Some speculated that it, uh, she did it to publicise her books and boost some sales. Well, any publicity is good publicity, I guess. <laughs> And because of this, many were furious at the funds and resources that were wasted on the search in their eyes. Another theory was that perhaps she did it for revenge against her cheating husband. Perhaps she disappeared hoping that eventually he would be arrested for her murder. And even when she reappeared, perhaps this uh, would be uh, sufficiently uh, enough to tarnish his image in the long run. And in her book, she's a criminal mastermind, so why wouldn't she be one in real life? Others have speculated that she suffered a concussion-like brain injury in the car crash and then had no idea what she was doing. But probably the most common theory, other than the publicity stunt, is that her disappearance was the side effect of some sort of mental breakdown. According to her biographer, Andrew Norman, the novelist may well have been in what is known as a fugue state, or more technically, a psychogenic trance. It's a rare condition brought on by trauma or depression, and in this case, the death of her mother and the breakdown of her marriage may have caused her to not realise what she was doing during that period. Right. Uh, Norman says the uh, adoption of her new personality, Theresa Neal, and her failure to recognise herself in the newspapers were signs that she had fallen into psychogenic amnesia. There's also speculation that it was a, an aborted suicide attempt. In 1934, Christie wrote Unfinished Portrait, a semi-autobiographical novel under the, her pen name Mary Westmacott. In this book, a character called... You can pick any name! <laughs> I know. In this book, a character called Celia attempts suicide and Christy writes, it was wicked of her to even consider taking her own life. And a lot of people have said that's her writing about this incident. But throughout the rest of her life, Agatha herself never publicly discussed the disappearance and apparently never spoke of this time with her family or friends. Okay. She, All right. She also barely mentioned the incident in her autobiography. Despite it being one of the most famous weeks of her life, she just wrote down how she hated notoriety of any kind and that the press were so unbearable she found it hard to go on living at that time. And that is the only mention of this incident in her autobiography. So what, she gets back in the car and they're driving her home, they're like, what happened? She's like, yeah. we're not talking uh -uh, about uh -uh. it. Where have you been? Oh, <laughs> uh oh. -uh. Uh -uh. It's like an like a angsty teenager. We don't talk about it. That was me as a teenager. <laughs> and an adult. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't allowed to not talk about it until you were eight years old. Yeah, and then I could not talk about it. Uh, but you'll be pleased to hear, guys, that she bounced back. She made a quick recovery, both health and career-wise, and continued on writing. Agatha and Archie remained apart, and finally, accepting her marriage was over in 1928, they divorced. And Archie married his mistress. There you go. <laughs> Uh, one of Agatha's lifelong ambitions had been to travel on the Orient Express. Okay, the night boat. The <laughs> car. <Cara. laughs> night boat train. The night boat train to Georgia. Anyway. Uh, and she took her first journey in 1928 after her marriage broke down. It was at an archaeological site in Ur in Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iraq, that she met the 25 year old archaeologist in training, Max. Mellaman, who was to become her second husband. How old is she at this point? She's about 36, 37. Cool. She's made him up. <laughs> uh, Max uh, Mellaman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got, new, you got a new man in your life. Yeah, what's his name? Max. Yeah, Max. Mellaman. Mellaman. Oh, That's no. Mellaman. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, Max was asked to, to, uh, to show Agatha around the, uh, the archaeological sites, which he found fascinating, and they found each other's company relaxing. They married in 1930, and by this time she had already written a dozen books. 
Her second world famous character, Miss Marple, also debuted in that year in a novel called Murder at the Vicarage. 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 Oh, it's a fun word. It is nice. With vicarage. The, with the ability. Vicarage. Everyone. Vicarage. That's very good. They just say it nice like normal people. Vicarage. <laughs> That's them. <laughs> That's what you sound like to us. Oh, Vicarage. Well, how do we say it? Ah, uh, Vicarage. <laughs> we really are the worst. Yeah, we're the worst. We suck. Uh, with the ability to see the worst in everyone, uh, she based her... This is Agatha Christie basing Miss Marple on her own grandmother. Cop her ability to grand. see the worst in everyone. Yeah. Oh, brutal. Cop that grand. That's not a good... That's not a trait you want. Look at this lovely waiter. Probably a pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> You know who doesn't see the worst in everyone? Mr. David Suchet. <laughs> what a kind soul. Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> Checking in. <laughs> oh, he's just doing a bit more shopping. Now he's on Ox- Oxford Street in London. Primark, a bit below his taste, I thought. <laughs> all right. Takes all sorts. How many times did you go to Primark oh. in the two days we were in London? See this shirt? <laughs> it's a Primark! <laughs> He was like, we'd be kind of near it. He was like, oh, we're near, we're near Primark. It's like, off you go. It's all Primark and that, what's that, Patamonje or something? Patamonje. <laughs> he loved that joint. He loves oh, I, lo- I love Patamonje. <laughs> Do you guys have that in Leeds, Patamonje? <laughs> Greg's is better. Greg's is better. Get <laughs> 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 your Greg heads in. <laughs> Gre- you'd love my Gregory tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's is better. Greg's is better. We went to a Greg's in Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan of Greg's. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is definitely one person leading that. Are What's you related going to Greg? On? I love Greg. Yeah. <laughs> and the people are with you. That's the best. All right, list other things you like. <laughs> So, Gr- Greg's is genuinely popular. All right. No lovers of Pret then. <laughs> Pret is for losers. Well, I guess you can call me a loser, baby. Because I love Pret. I also love Greg's. Wow. I did not want to lose the crowd over Pret. <laughs> Not worth it. That would not be worth it. That was the best. Greg's had a Greg's had a grapefruit salad. Have you had a Greg's fruit salad? Get a sausage roll. I fucked up. <laughs> Cheese, beans, and sausage melt. Yeah, you guys really know how to do food. Do you guys want me to bring up the Greg's menu and we'll just go through it? <laughs> Give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's all thumbs up. Who goes to Greg's for a salad? Who goes to Greg's for a salad? A man that's struggling to shit, okay? (laughs) Okay. There you go. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Jess has left. So we've lost lost Jess. Um. (laughs) Sorry that had to get so real, mate. Did it help? I'm How, sharing yeah, a I bathroom mean, with yeah. him. Did it help? The answer is, is there anything Greg can't fix? <laughs> Go Matt, can I use your bathroom later? Nothing makes me shit more than <laughs> Greg's. <laughs> Greg's! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're nearly here for the end of uh, Agatha's report. So she marries Max and he's an archaeologist. And uh, he became a big influence on her writing. The exotic locations that she visited with him, like Egypt, Mesopotamia, and then stuff like the Orient Express, became locations in her books. And this really set her apart from her contemporaries yet again. But she mentioned other places. Uh, Everything else was set at Greg's or... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, As a rule, Agatha wrote two or three books a year. And when with Max, often wrote a chapter or two during quiet mornings and then helped him out on the... Archaeological digs in the afternoon. Oh, teamwork. So, love that. Yeah, they're, they're a real power couple. Power couple. Love it. Yeah, support each other. <laughs> Similar to, they're kind of like England's very own Posh and Bex. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of a more, what's that, you know, the woman and the guy from recently? 
I was going for them, and then I ended up... The woman in the gun? You meant Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan, thank you. <laughs> man, oh. The man and the woman. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong, technically. But you're quite far from right. One's from Suits and one's from the palace. What a... It's star-crossed lovers. Did that make the news here? It was big down in Australia. <laughs> Did you guys get that hit? You got that? No. <laughs> um, so, World War II broke out and Agatha again uh, volunteered. It was during this World War II that she became a grandmother when her daughter Rosalind gave birth to her son, a, or a son, Matthew. By 1950, after the war... A she... beautiful name. Oh. Love those English names. <laughs> Madge. <laughs> Matt. Oh, no. <laughs> We're not so different, you and I, Madge. <laughs> Did you only just figure out that your name is Matthew? Okay. I wasn't allowed to know that until I was 102. <laughs> uh, by 1950, Agatha had already sold 50 million books and uh, started to slow down her output. I say slow down, but her Play the Mousetrap opened in the West End in 1952 and it's been running ever since, becoming easily the longest running play of all time with over 26,000 performances now. Yeah, it hasn't finished yet. <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't found the killer. It's also a great board game. Mousetrap? Yeah. It is. Yeah, that's why I said it. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. We should finish this combo later. <laughs> yeah, right. According to the official Mousetrap website, during its 66-year run... The game or the... <laughs> <laughs> they share a website. Could you believe that? <laughs> it's very confusing. Now, during its 66-year run, the play, there have been no fewer than 474 actors and actresses appearing in the play, 279 understudies, and 142 miles of shirt that has been ironed for the play. How many big silver balls? That was a little niche bit there, but the ones who liked it really Do liked not it. Clap him. Uh, my favourite kind of applause is a smattering, so thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better, because the thing I love about a smattering is it takes as much effort for the people not to clap <laughs> as it does for those to clap. <laughs> They're just ignoring it. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Silver balls, all right. It's good stuff, you'll get it later. Yeah, it's a thinker. Uh, Agatha's love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, man. Agatha's last public appearance was at the opening night of the 1974 film version of Mo Mo Moida. Moida on the, on the Orient Express, starring Albert Finney as Hercule Poirot. Her verdict, a good adaptation with the minor point that Poirot's moustaches weren't luxurious enough. You know whose lux uh, moustaches are luxurious enough? David Suchet nailed it. Oh my goodness. Down, he's got an egg shaped head exactly like she described. What? Perfect casting. Just let you think about that. Uh, the final novel published in her lifetime had, in fact, been written many decades earlier. It was called Curtain Poirot's Last Case. Christie wrote the novel in the early 1940s during the Second World War. Partly fearing for her own survival and partly wanting to have a fitting end for Poirot's series of novels, Christie had the novel locked away in a bank vault for over 30 years. Knowing that she could no longer write any novels, the elderly Christie authorised Curtin's removal from the vault and subsequently its publication in 1975. Can you imagine her rereading it, though? After 30 years... You've forgotten it a little bit? No, she would have forgotten it and also been like, this is trash. <laughs> if I looked at something I wrote 30 years ago, uh, it wouldn't exist. Um, <laughs> All right, Matt, if you looked at something you'd written 30 years ago... It would have been, oh, I've had another great-grandchild. Um, <laughs> is it? I reckon if I, if I put it in a vault and got it out and went, really, curtain? Are you a mystery about, something about you'd, something you'd written curtains? Or? What happened? Like, curtains were taken? Sounds stupid. <laughs> yeah. What? Yep. Well, I can tell you, it sees the old duo of Poirot and Hastings team up for the last time, meeting again at Styles, where they'd first appeared together 50 years earlier in their first novel. She wrote the novel at the height of her powers and for decades knew how the series would end. Her powers. Oh, she was a witch. Oh. <laughs> at the height of her powers. <laughs> it's a very evil novel. 
Got it. Uh, she died peacefully the next year on the 12th of January 1976 at the age of 85. She is buried in the churchyard of St. Mary's near Wallingford. And finally, just a bit about her legacy. According to the Guinness World Records, she's the world's best-selling fiction writer with her 78 crime novels having sold an estimated... 78. 78. Uh, Two more. Right, two more. Or stop three ago. Well, they have sold an estimated 2 billion copies in 44 languages. Dave, can I just quickly do my impress, imp- impersonation of the character from Poirot called what's the what's the psychic's Gregory's name again? Captain Hastings. Does anyone know that show with uh, David Suckett? <laughs> I've been working on this because I've been Dave. I watched the first season. I really like it. I love this. I love Gregory heaps and <laughs> and I re- I'm I'm not fucking around. I reckon I, this is exactly what he sounds like, right? What's his go. surname again? Hastings. 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 Right. I say. <laughs> that is great. If you knew the source, that is great. I say. Nailed it. Nailed it? Clap again. You didn't deserve it the hey. first time. Whoa. They let them clap. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. Let them clap. Right. Let clappers be. Little smattering there. I got two smatterings back to back. I say. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Greg's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my final sentence is: uh, her books continue to sell well, and her royalties are estimated to be in the millions every year. So good on her one grandchild, Matthew. Uh, she is outsold only. By the Bible and William Shakespeare. What a life for Agatha Christie! Thank you so much. Let's all do it. Thank you. That was the best. I suspelled at least one eighth of a drink. Whoa. Whoa. For your tiny throat. Yeah, my tiny gullet. That is impressive. That's very good. Uh, But that uh, (laughs) pretty much leads, brings us to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I say. I say. Good Lord. (laughs) My grandma, the 94 year old, actually says that. She surprised by something. My parents told her they were going to Russia for a holiday, and her response was, Good Lord. It's still the 1940s for her. I'm like, oh, I'm going to Cuba. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> the UK, she was fine with that. She was okay. totally fine with that. Oh. She said, say hi to Winston. <laughs> <laughs> her old school chum. Good Lord. Guys, give it up for Dave. Why don't give his oh, report? <laughs> well done. Uh, that was a bit of fun. Thank you uh, so much for coming out. It really, it does blow our minds that we could come to Leeds, a place that I have never been to before, none of us have ever been to before, yeah. and that you all turn up. So thank you so much. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Yeah. Saturday afternoon. Even even the venue are like, oh, what is this? And is it going to sell tickets? And it yeah. did. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's very nice of you. And having said that, we'd like to thank uh, thank you to The Wardrobe. Fantastic venue. Amazing. We've got Dave on sound. Trey, the manager, Dave. helped us with everything. Fantastic. It's been an absolute delight to, to be here. So I guess the plan is now we're going to wrap up. If you would like to uh, hang out for a bit, we've, uh, we've got some T-shirts that will be selling over there in the corner. If you just want to come up, say hello or get a photo or anything, um, Please do stick around. It's going to be a bit of fun. Yep. It's going to be Believe a bit the of fun. Bar. A bit of fun. Believe the bar will be open. And then we'll, So we'll be here for a little bit and then uh, we'll clear everyone out. And if you are, if you do want to stick around for that second show, the doors will open for that at 4.30 and then we'll come on stage at 5 o'clock and it will be a very loose affair. Yeah, it's going to get a little bit weird probably. Yeah. So, so if you're up for it, why not? One more show. Thank yeah. you so much. So uh, uh, that brings us to the, the end of the episode. Matt, Jess, do you have anything else you need to say? No. Apart from um, 
long live Greg's and um, God bless you all and uh, be nice to each other and good on that man and woman. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys. Bye bye.